Good afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch, and I'm happy to see still so many faces with us and bearing with us. We are now having our next talk, and I would like to welcome Dr. Karen Lux from Global Feedback NGO. And she is leading a work package on Horizon 2020 research project where they are uh, looking to, uh, into the use of uh, uh, food waste in feed production. And uh, I would like to welcome you. The floor is you. Thank you, Dr. Lux. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so um, as was introduced, we work with Refresh on food waste. The majority of the program focuses on um, the prevention of food waste in the first place throughout the supply chain, and this is just one small part of it. So don't say to me, we have to first prevent it. I absolutely agree. Um, <clears throat> so as, um, yeah, we, what I will be presenting here is kind of a multidisciplinary bit of research that we've been doing around the safety, economic and environmental aspects to do with the use of surplus food as animal feed. Um, and we've got people involved in that particular bit of work of Wageningen University, uh, the University of Bologna and the Research Institutes of Sweden, all academic institutes as well as ourselves as an environmental NGO. So you'll see towards the end of the presentation there will be some sort of value judgments and ideas about utility uh, functions that I will be bringing in uh, that I've been learning about. Um, also to point out that um, <clears throat> We are not, or I'm definitely not a risk expert in any shape or form, uncertainty, so I'm learning a lot and I might mix up some of the concepts and we've heard a lot about how language and ambiguities in the language can, can muddle up things and maybe mislead, be misleading. So, um, yeah, I'm really just looking forward because this is a bit of a conundrum or a problem or a challenge that I want to put to risk experts and get um, feedback and insight um, back from you. Okay, so, yeah, so what are we talking about? Um, <clears throat> so, like I was saying, the safety, economic, and environmental aspects of um, actually changing legislation that would allow the feeding of meat-containing surplus food to omnivorous, non-ruminant livestock, such as pigs and chickens. This is currently prohibited, and I think even um, two years ago, it was impossible to mention this uh, in, in kind of many events. It was a little bit taboo in Europe, but slowly we're breaking this open. Um, I think Refresh is the first project in Europe that is starting to look at this seriously. So we're very much at the beginning of research there. So, um, and obviously with the time, I can only give you a very brief um, insight to what we've been doing. So we definitely need to maintain the feed ban for ruminants uh, because of TSE and also for untreated or raw surplus food. So we say we can manage the risks if we lift the ban on meat-containing heat-treated surplus food, but only from um, uh, tightly controlled licensed facilities. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, in other countries like the US, Japan, New Zealand, on-farm on treatment is still permitted, but we say that with the situation in the EU, the fact how foot and mouth happened in, two, in the 2001, and for example, the current threat of African swine fever, really that's not a, a good idea. So we say only uh, food that's been treated in these specialist plants should be allowed. So yeah, no surplus from households or international catering. <clears throat> so this is a little bit of an overview of what I want to put to you today. Um, so we've got risks around um, known disease and I'll talk about how we uh, propose to manage the risks. Um, emerging disease. And then on the benefit side, we would argue there are benefits in terms of food security, climate change mitigation. But then there's whole bits of uncertainty that get mixed into this uh, that make it more difficult to see how this balance works out. So on the risk management of the known diseases, uh, we can apply heat treatment, very common obviously in food safety anyway. Um, with the microbiologists from Wageningen University, we. Um, identified what would be the most heat-resistant pathogens that are of concern to the pig industry. Foot and mouth disease is the most heat-resistant, as well as uh, porcine respiratory and um, reproductive syndrome. If we target those pathogens, we will deal with more heat-sensitive ones, such as African swine fever. Um, <clears throat> acidification has a whole lot of um, advantages as well. Uh, it can also help us um, to deal, for example, with uh, prevention of outgrowth of toxin-producing uh, spore-forming um, 
bacteria such as Clostridium. And there are other advantages too. So we propose an acidification step um, as the Japanese currently also do. And of course, the role of biosecurity is very important to prevent cross-contamination with the treated food waste and the um, untreated or raw food waste. Um, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We think the measures as described in the animal byproduct legislation for rendering are perfectly adequate and should be applied in this case too. <clears throat> but there are uncertainties. Um, any food microbiologist will obviously tell you there's never such a thing as a zero risk. So we will always have a tiny fraction of pathogens that can survive. Here, that <laughs> percentage example, I put it in percentage because I'm not a risk manager and that's how I could get my head around it. But this is a 15 log reduction of, of a certain pathogen. And in fact, that's quite high because in food, it's normally a six log reduction. The highest one that I'm aware of would be 12 log reduction for Clostridium botulinum. Um, <clears throat> then um, the other um, challenge we have is how much actually infected meat do we have? And that relates with um, partly with the, the illegal imports of infected meat. And obviously the uncertainty is very big there. It's very hard to know, um, as well as the viral loads within that. <clears throat> and then we have human error. Um, and... Uh, also the deliberate breaking of the law, which is how the foot and mouth epidemic started in the first place. So that's, that's a, yeah, a difficult uncertainty, I would say, to, to kind of take into account how you, how you deal with that. <clears throat> uh, we have in our project a whole set of proposals actually on how you do controls to make sure to, to prevent this from happening, but still. Um, <clears throat> then, emerging disease, so uh, that, that's where it gets complicated because if we use mixed uh, surplus food from catering sources, we may have traces of pork in the pig feed. Um, <clears throat> and for some people this is very shocking, but actually intraspecies recycling is observed in over a thousand species from fish to insect to mammals. Um, scientists say this is not an aberrant behavior limited to confined or highly stressed populations, but a normal response to many environmental factors. It's um, known to happen in a uh, wild boar. And obviously we would say we need to prevent um, stress-induced forms of, um, of intraspecies recycling, such as tail biting or the savaging of piglets by the, um, by the south. But if we look from a safety perspective, if we look at the EFSA Biohaz opinion, it does state significant amounts of BSE infected materials have been fed to pigs with no infectivity. Um, Intraspecies recycling may well have happened quite often prior to the ban. There's been and still no naturally occurring TSE or BSE has ever been detected so far in pigs. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that bit. In, yeah, so. <clears throat> And intraspecies recycling is actually not an issue outside the EU, where TSE is not considered a hazard for non-ruminant livestock. It's just considered a hazard for ruminants. Um, and you look at kind of the research that's out there on the nutritional side. In the US, they talk about the nutritional advantage of replacing fish meal in piglet diets with processed porcine intestines, for example. Sounds quite strange, but, but it's done. Or the use of um, swine skin, processed swine skin in in, in pig diets. Um, so I think, and, and this, I don't know what's going through your head right now, but I think this is where it gets really complicated because we have the application of the precautionary principle in the current intraspecies recycling ban. But I think, I don't know, in my view, it feels quite mixed up with sort of ethical and moral concerns. And this is gets, where it gets very, very complicated. And, you know, this is not an issue elsewhere. In Japan, they have the value of multi-nai, which expresses a sense of regret regarding waste. And there, this value of multi-nai completely trumps the idea of, um, of the fact that a little bit of pork may end up in the pig feed. Um, but, of course, in the EU context, um, we, because of expected sort of consumer reaction, we think that it's better to have single species um, feed production plants so that any leftovers, from, for example, from a pork sausage factory don't go to pig feed, but would instead go to poultry feed. But still, lifting the intraspecies recycling ban would open up the way to recycle what we've calculated 14 million tons of food that currently goes to waste out of the 88 million tons in total to be turned into feed. And that's a sort of a minimum, a very conservative um, example. And 
I also think we need to look at the risk within uh, wider risk around ever more intensive um, farming um, systems that are partly driven by costs. And in the EU, the cost of feed for pig farms uh, makes up between 54 and 70 percent of um, the total production cost. And we know from the Japanese experience that we can actually produce feed from leftovers at about half of that cost. So we could actually take some of the pressures away that drive intensive farming. And we know from, from research, um, you know, high density uh, livestock farming and in the pig case, you know, the clonal nature of pig genetics can sort of lead to a monoculture environment driving the emergence of novel disease or um, also um, sort of the um, yeah, new virulent strains of, of, of existing disease. So there's kind of bits to throw in there. Now, going on to the um, benefits, we've got here, um, this is a consequential life cycle assessment that was uh, done by Refresh. Um, and if you look at, so the orange bit here is um, the avoided um, production of conventional feed. So we do no longer need to, that means we no longer need to import soya uh, from Brazil, which is still connected to deforestation. I can give you lots more details, but anybody who works on climate and diet knows that this, this is a big challenge to soya. Um, and the blue bit is about avoiding the, the consequences of landfill and incineration. We have the gray um, here. That would be the new cost that we need to treat the, the food waste and make it safe. And also we have an extra cost, a little orange bar at the top where we take food waste out of anaerobic digestion plants and your, gen, your energy would have to be um, created in a different way. So if we add all those bits together, we have a net effect there of a carbon saving. So this is uh, calculated on sort of existing marking, market conditions in France. I've extrapolated from uh, our French and we've done the same study for the UK and done sort of an estimated average and it's just an estimate because conditions will be quite different in other countries but from that estimate we have a minimum and I'm kind of wary of <laughs> what I heard yesterday about the use of this kind of wording but anyway, a minimum estimated emission savings for the EU of 5.8 million tonnes CO2 equivalent if we were to um, convert our feeding of, of pigs in that way. Um, and just to give you a rough idea what that means um, for people who don't work often with these kinds of uh, figures. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, nearly getting there. So, obviously, the climate change mitigation has all sorts of links to food and feed safety. Just two examples here. I'm not an expert on it, but I think that's something we would need to put into the balance. And the big question, food security within planetary boundaries. So we know that in a diet that is uh, good for both human and planetary health, we need to have a drastic reduction of animal source food. Um, and we would say that actually, instead of a vegan diet, uh, and this is um, Van Zandt and et al, that um, a um, diet that has small bits of animal sourced food from livestock that was fed on feed that did not compete for land with crops that could be fed directly to humans is probably the most efficient diet. Um, and within that is the food security part. And, um, you know, this is a graph we got from the EU Agricultural Outlook looking at wheat prices, but, um, you know, wheat, barley, soya, all these uh, commodities that are part of conventional pig diets, there's loads of uncertainty there. Um, and if we can actually de decouple some of that and have our, a part of our feed come from uh, treated um, food waste, we could maybe reduce uncertainties there. So um, this is where kind of the value judgment and the utility bit comes in. I think if I've been um, picking up things properly from um, the previous presentations. So that's how I see the current situation, um, where also we have actually a ban that is... Um, not properly enforced, because just look at the spread of African swine fever currently in Europe. You know, it's, it's a big problem and that shows that the ban isn't quite working. Or do we actually um, go and start to invest? Um, yeah, so we've also done the life cycle costing at the national level for UK and France, showing that there can be savings at a national level because the cost of feed is so expensive, the conventional cost of feed. It can also be commercially viable at relatively small treatment plants, and I can go into more detail if people have questions about that. Can we use these savings to 
kind of invest in wider monitoring and preparedness for, monit uh, for novel disease in this context of climate change. But the big issue really is, you know, if we are to stay within that 1.5 degree centigrade um, global temperature rise, we do need rapid and far-changing or far-reaching transition in all sorts of sectors, and land is the one where we would be contributing here because we will reduce the land use um, that goes on feed crops. But yeah, this, I think this last slide is maybe not risk or uncertainty, it's this whole value and um, value judgment part of things that, that we bring in as an NGO, as an environmental NGO. Um, yeah. I think that's it from me. I'm really looking forward to your thoughts and questions and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lux. There are already questions. Yes, please. I don't, yeah, it's working. <clears throat> um, so, can I use ionizing radiation in place of heat? Is it as if, I understand that, you know, there may be public acceptance issues, but it'll result in significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions than almost any heat source, unless you're using nuclear, which you're certainly not going to be doing. Uh, talk about that. Can I, can I do all of the, the necessary uh, sterilization with ionizing radiation? Um. I, I don't know. It's not, we have looked at, I've looked at different things and I did not know of this option. What we do know is that interestingly the major energy use for our proposal comes from the collection of the, of the food waste from different sources, the transport. So if we can make that energy efficient, in fact the energy for the heat treatment becomes quite insignificant in comparison. So it's not the major concern, but it's something I will look into. We, we do use ionizing radiation for pasteurization of some products, uh, at least in North America. Yeah. But yeah, I think the challenge is the mix, the mix of the different kind of, um, of the food waste and we need to reduce particle size, for example, to have, yeah, there's kind of different aspects to, I think, the fact that it's a mixed kind of material that makes it challenging. Are there any other questions from the audience? If not, I would have one. Um, I mean, we have seen so much about uh, how to evaluate uncertainties, and in your project, you have identified a lot of uncertainties. Are you trying to characterize a few of them by, for example, also using expert elicitation techniques? No, we, we, that, that would be the, one of the next steps we need to do. Because what we've done most, so most of our energy and research has gone into the actual um, risk management of the, of the existing or the known diseases such as African swine fever and foot and mouth disease because this was kind of, yeah, even two years ago people wouldn't even think this was possible when I mean, in fact it was being done in Japan so that's the resources we've had but I think that would be, would be an important step. I mean there is some literature for example on estimated imports of illegal um, infected meat but for example, on that one, my view, in fact, would be that we have to make very conservative assumptions as in very high viral loads, and therefore we're setting very high inactivation objectives to, de to deal with that. But I think in the next step, we need to be more systematic and do that, and that's one of the things I've, I think I've picked up a lot here, and I'll go back to a lot of the presentations and the methodologies, to, and hopefully some of the experts maybe here to help us with that. <laughs> Good to know, there seems to be more work in the future for a few of you. Thank you. If there's no other question, thank you, Dr. Lurks.